it's great to be here. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Well, this is my hometown, and I actually I live right now in Oklahoma, uh, Tulsa. Um, but uh, I grew up here, and this was uh, the last college I attended actually before just going crazy entrepreneur. So. Um, I, I hope we'll see you on Thursday because we are going to be actually doing a build a business workshop. So if you have an idea for a business, we're going to work on designing it and helping build it. Uh, and then it'll position you very well to enter into the competition. Okay, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you what I call the seeker, an entrepreneurial journey. And I'm going to share with you my entrepreneurial journey to give you an idea of what it's like to, to be an entrepreneur and how the road and the journey is not always clear how, how things will turn out. Um, what I need you to have in front of you, though, is a piece of paper and a pen ready to write. We are going to be doing some visual thinking exercises. You'll understand a little bit more as we go along. Um, so if you're ready, we'll get right into it. So here's the notion, right? This idea of out of the box, we gotta think out of the box. And we're hearing this more and more. It's not a new concept. We used to talk about it a lot when I was starting businesses here in the Valley. But the notion that you have to be thinking out of the box is acknowledging you have a box, right? So there's something that's blocking you or something that's preventing you from thinking in creative in different ways. And what I like to call it instead is what box? There is no box. The only boxes that exist are the boxes you create yourself. So the idea here is to realize that anything is possible and move into more of instead of a think out of the box mindset, a what box mindset. So my name is uh, Heidi Said is Sean Griffin. I am a serial entrepreneur, but I'm also a visual thinker. So I've been practicing graphic facilitation and using visual thinking as a method to advance businesses, corporations, governments, cities, universities, you name it. I've been using this kind of technique, and that is capturing people's ideas and facilitating them through their goals and objectives, but also helping visualize how to start a startup, how to build a business. At the time when I was doing this, this was 22 years ago, there were 12 of us. Most of them were in San Francisco uh, doing this kind of work. There's now about 250 people who are actively, professionally, graphically facilitating meetings. So I was born here in this lovely state. We we're very, very, very fortunate in California, and particularly here in the Bay Area, to have such an abundance of creativity, talent, and resources to help us innovate, come up with ideas, create anything we want to create. There's a, there's a trust level here and an excitement around creating and building things and making a difference that is unique around the world. And I've been traveling. I've just been in five continents in the last five, well, 30 days. So I actually grew up right here in Saratoga. So this is my hometown for real. Like I, this is where I grew up. And so when there still were fields out here before there were homes, if anybody remembers that. And so the great thing about growing up here, again, is that I happen to be born at the time of the birth of the internet. So things just started to take off. Technology was starting to blossom. And so things were, things were starting to happen and the dream of what the internet could be was something that was new at the time. And so the thing is I was also raised by an architect family. So, I mean, part, pardon me, by an entrepreneurial family. My, my father was an architect, been in his own business his entire life since getting out of school. And my mother was in the real estate business. They both still are officing in Los Gatos um, right now. Like so many other entrepreneurs out there, I have attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And I'm dyslexic on top of that, which actually goes together. So who else in here is ADHD dyslexic? Anybody else? Raise their hand. Thank you. That's not true, actually. So my friend, I appreciate your boldness to raise your hand. 25% of any population is ADHD and dyslexic. 25%. Research has shown it. So 25% of this room is that. But you're compensating. You're making up for it. I propose you look at it as a gift. And if you're having trouble learning or if you're having trouble in some way that, that, that's creative and, and not normal, what boxy? There's the likelihood you have ADHD and dyslexia, which is a good thing. It's a gift. 
total gift. New research is showing our brains have a different shape. We actually think and process differently. So here's the thing that happened back then. This is in the 70s. By the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was removed from 12 schools. West Valley College was the last school I went to. So the school system and the way things are and, 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 you know, didn't work so well for me, but my creativity, I had to keep going. So what I started doing, because my father, I started learning architectural illustrating. So I started illustrating uh, shadows and trees and, and different illustrations for Kaufman and Broad, if anybody knows that large uh, home builder group, and started making some pretty good money. But the thing was, I was isolated. So I'm working in a cubicle, if you will, drawing all day. The only person to talk to is myself. It's not very good for someone who's like me, who's very social. So I started managing Safeway store. I was, a, when I was a 18 year old manager at the Saratoga Safeway store because I could engage with people, started getting exciting about, you know, being creative. And what I did is I started, because it kind of is boring, I could predict exactly what to order right now. I could do it right now with my eyes closed. Go in there, how to do a, how to do a display. I started working on creating these beautiful arrangements and uh, uh, point of sales displays. Actually building like large sailing ships, pirate ships that rocked with volcanoes and, and water coming flowing down. So got into it, started winning awards. But again, I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't know I'm an entrepreneur, right? But I'm, I'm not happy, I'm not satisfied. Things are, things are not where I want them to be. So I started looking at, you know, why am I here? Like I just had this burning thing, like well, there's a purpose, something inside of me that I need to pay attention to and I didn't know what that was. So somewhere along that line, along that around that time, I said, hey, I've got a purpose. The idea of the seeker, right? What is my purpose? Why am I supposed to be here? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? So I started searching more clearly, more intentionally about what is I'm supposed to do. That's when I got this aha. Hey, guess what? I'm actually an entrepreneur. I've got this entrepreneurial spirit. I started my first company actually when I was nine years old. Didn't even realize it, right? I'm mowing lawns. I had to make money to buy a bike. My parents wouldn't, wouldn't give me any money. What are you talking about? I gotta, go get, I gotta go make the money. So I went and started my first company, mowing lawns. Then I met this guy. And this is 1992. Anybody recognize who this is? Nobody? How you doing? Welcome. Hi, Ross Perot, and nobody knows who Ross Perot is? <laughs> he ran for President of the United States uh, when George W. Bush and Bill Clinton were running for office. Bill Clinton ended up winning, but Ross Perot captured my imagination, and I actually got to work with him. And I was going up and down the West Coast, Seattle, all the way down to um, San Diego, promoting this guy for President. And I learned this thing called town halls. Like that's what we would do. We'd organize these giant town halls and we'd engage with people. Back to what I get passionate about, right? Engaging with people, seeing people spark and find what's important to them. At the same time, I started getting into visual thinking and the idea of graphic recording and that is capturing ideas while people are talking. Large scale, big. I'll do a little bit today with you. So, started combining these and got involved and found, well, co-founded my first nonprofit. So not even a for-profit really, right? A nonprofit. Well, we were going around working with different community organizers and business, uh, and pardon me, community leaders to create and identify common ground. In Cupertino, we were working on female Im image issues for females. Awesome stuff, Supp um, supporting people in lots of different ways. This is around the same time that the LA riots. Anybody remember the LA riots? Occurred? Nobody? Okay. So the LA riots, this is a big deal, right? Everybody's kind of up in arms. Rodney King, what's going on? This Italian princess liked what we were doing. She started sponsoring us. Imagine that, an Italian princess. That was changing my life at this point because now I must be on the right track because we've got this Italian princess who's willing to support and sponsor us. So we moved to LA and we started enhancing, pardon me, we started enhancing our common ground programming by working with the Crips and the Bloods. You may know who these guys are? Yeah, they're not really friendly people, generally speaking, but guess what? When you get to know them, they're just like you and me, 
They're just like you and me. They're looking for love, right? They're looking for someone to like them. They're looking to be in a place where they have connection. They're looking for common ground. And what we were able to do was show them how they actually had more in common than they had apart. Awesome. The challenge was, <laughs> I'm living on Mulholland Drive in this mansion next to Matt Growing, Simpsons, and Margaret, having dinner with Oliver Stone, Timothy Leary, whatever you can possibly imagine actually is real. It's a very crazy place, LA. So I'm having dinner with these stars, hanging out, which is fantastic and fun. Meanwhile, going back into South Central LA, working with the Crips and Bloods, complete surreal life, not, not something I'd recommend. And I hadn't learned how to protect my heart. So I was way too connected to things, and I let people into me, and so I was just, it was wearing me out. So I, I quit. Couldn't do it. I was, gonna, I was either gonna die from partying with too much in LA, or I was gonna die because someone was gonna break my heart. Saw a couple carjackings in front of us, just, just whatever you can imagine, changed my life. So, came back home, secured $35,000 in funding, and started Universal Art Support, one of the first online auction houses before eBay. Technology proved it wasn't there, it was a great experience, and we were using, my buddy Gordon and Ruto and I, who were partners at the time, were using this thing, graphic recording and facilitation, and started getting gigs while we were, so how we started funding ourselves, bootstrap, using and leveraging the resources you have available to you to maximize and take you where you wanna go. Bootstrapping is an important skill set to have in life, but specifically if you're gonna start or build any kind of business. So we started this company, Vital Pathways. Universal Art Support didn't work. Miss it, love it, fantastic experience. But Vital Pathways became very interesting. We started getting these really interesting clients and making quite a bit of money. And so we said, hey, we're on to something here. So we started this little consulting company and we started working with Xerox at Xerox Park, experimenting with distance, simulcast, graphic recording, visualization with people in Malaysia and in Silicon Valley and seeing if you could actually communicate visually. Now we have Skype, right? early days. At this time, Silicon Valley was in a deep recession. So there was concern that Silicon Valley was going to find itself in a very bad situation. So they started this thing called Joint Venture Silicon Valley, which I became a, a founding member of, and we still have, it's still around today. Every once in a while you hear, see reports on it. Founding member, this is 1992, still in 1992, 93 here. And, um, got involved in restarting the economic engine of the valley and really got excited about what was going on and got hooked up with NASA. NASA was one of the major funders of this project and started getting involved in incubators, one of the first actually in, in the valley, Mountain View, called the Enterprise Network, eventually moved to Saratoga and started learning about commercialization of technology. So I was helping facilitate using my skills visual think physicists and other people who had invented things at NASA and helping connect people who have business ideas together and starting to commercialize technology. Something that we have a lot more of today, but at the time it was kind of a new concept. The other thing that happened along this time, because I'm a serial entrepreneur, I still don't fully understand I'm a serial entrepreneur, and this is where I met Alice, was during the Digital Clubhouse, 1996 now. Trying to see if you could use network multimedia technology to create and build community. Right? by helping people create short three to five minute movies based upon their lives. Hadn't been done before, right? Brand new thinking, connecting women, seniors, we called it little hands helping big hands, 15 year old, helping people who are adults who understand how to use technology. There was a big concern that people wouldn't be, there was just gonna be this huge digital divide and people weren't gonna be able to get access to the internet. Kind of crazy to think about today. So back to my, dig my dyslexia, right? I'm dyslexic, right? So I'm connected to a lot of people in that community and started uh, using, helping people with dyslexia and different disabilities, um, coined a term differently abled at the time, to create these short digital stories. Now, this is where it gets interesting because, again, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I don't know it. So I'm, I'm kind of just, I think at the time, Alice, well, how many projects did I have? 75 projects we had listed at one time? So imagine 75 projects, all going at simultaneously. 
75. I don't recommend it. Don't recommend it because you're not doing a lot of things well. So that's when I met a physicist who worked on ARPANET. Her name was Susie Chu. She was actually part of the core team that built the internet, which was called ARPANET before it was the internet. And she was one of the few people who knew how to code electronic commerce, something we are very familiar with today. And we built one of the first 200, we got a certificate, I think we were 173 electronic commerce websites for this character. Cat in the hat, Dr. Seuss. Started working with the Geisel Estate and built one of the first electronic commerce websites. And what I'm doing now is I'm connecting my passion, right? My passion for pop culture, for the cat in the hat, with what I love to do, create and build things, right? And build team. And so here's what happens. All of a sudden, we start getting exclusive license to over 2,500 hours of original television content and some famous ca uh, characters from around the world. Hulu before Hulu. We're broadcasting these in short three to five minute chunks because the bandwidth wasn't there. Building this amazing company, getting contracts backdoored Hollywood. Totally. All of a sudden, Hollywood's coming to us. Agencies are coming to us because they're finding out, wait a minute, you've got the exclusive rights to Underdog and exclusive broadcast rights on the internet. Exclusive, nobody else could do it. Amazing, first contracts of their kind. Fantastic experience. Inducted Howdy Doody into the NBC Walk of Fame. Anybody know who Howdy Doody is? All right, we got somebody over here, dyslexic, my dyslexic friend, <laughs> I love you. Howdy Doody is one of the first television shows on TV. Gumby and Pokey are a spin out, out of the Howdy Doody show. It was a puppet, 50s. That's a younger me with Katie Couric, today's show. Got married around this time. So here I am, you know, CEO of this growing company. We've gone from two people to like 68, growing by two to three employees a week, cranking it out. And I get married in the middle of this. Best decision I've ever made period. Changed my life, helped me, balanced me, because I'm, I'm, I'm one speed, full speed ahead, you know, don't stop, keep going. Our company's so successful, we're going public. Merrill Lynch has taken us public. $300 million on paper. We hit it. We're there. We did our, we, we made it. We lived the dream, the Silicon Valley dream. It's happening, right? Fortunately, it was June of 2000. And we had this thing called the dot-com bubble burst. And we had an unsecured bridge loan for $2 million at, with, at, at the same time of pets.com. If anybody remembers this period, pets.com, we were the bellwether. So we both went out simultaneously and were the very beginning of what was the dot-com bubble burst. And I call it going around a racetrack 500 miles per hour. You crash, the race is still going. You're just not in the race anymore. I mean, it's completely out of this race and had put so much time and energy and resources and effort into everything to make this company go. We're going public, 500,000 miles a year I was traveling. Every year, 500,000 miles, cutting deals, making things happen. So what do you do after you've been working on a company that's not going public and all of a sudden you're not gonna be a billionaire and oh, by the way, you don't have funds anymore because they have gone off and they're looking for other jobs and you don't know what you're gonna do. You take a Route 66 road trip. At least that's what my wife and I decided to do. We had three weeks. We said, let's go on a road trip. Little did I know how much this road trip would change our lives. We ended up in Oklahoma at this lake called Grand Lake. That's a picture from my old house that was there. We ended up buying 2,600 lakefront feet a little compound in the middle of nowhere, back of a hollow, and ended up moving to Zena, Oklahoma, population 274. It became 276 when Kristen and I moved there. Didn't know a single soul. The goal was to become an outsider artist and an author. That was my new goal. Forget entrepreneurship, forget about businesses. This is not for me. I'm not gonna do that again. You can't make me. That was, I'm done. Four and a half years, got into market research. So I was lived there four and a half years. Got into market research, had this guy in New York, his name's Lou Moskowitz, he's like, you're so cool, you live in Oklahoma, I think we can market that and sell it because there's something really sexy about you being in Oklahoma and all the things you've done. And I'm like, yeah, it's weird, I know, why am I in Oklahoma? He's like, yeah, but let's leverage it. So we start this market research company, 
$5,000 a day, JP Morgan, AT&T, start paying me to go do what I do. Well, it was so much money, I couldn't really turn it down, so I was spending two weeks every month in New York, got an apartment, and then this thing happened that we'll all remember. I was supposed to be in Windows in the World. Is that picture still there? I was supposed to be there on September 12th because of my town hall experience. The mayoral primary was taking place on the 11th, was supposed to take place. Two remaining candidates were going to be part of a town hall that I was going to graphically facilitate. So less than 24 hours from being in one of those buildings to being in Manhattan at the time, stuck going, whoa, wait a minute. I think there's a reason for Oklahoma. Shut down all my business, quit doing it, quit all the clients, said I'm not, I flew back once, the plane was completely empty, I was, there were two people on the plane, I said that's it, I'm done. Started focusing all my energy into Oklahoma, and wrote my first box. I, Alice and I worked together on this. What box? Out of the box thinking for career and life. And this was the beginning of this whole notion of what box. It took four years to write this first book. Once I wrote down the first words, because it was very hard, six books now, we're working on our seventh. So once you write your first book, it gets much easier over time. So I recommend, if you have a notion to write a book, just get your first book done. It's hard, but it's much easier to do today, self-publishing and all those different tools that are out there. But what box really started me thinking about, hmm, I really can do anything because remember, back to no real formal education for any long period of time, right? It's kind of all jumpy, right? Dyslexia. Uh, so resolution, to started another company. But then here's, here's what's interesting. What happened is, I'm in Oklahoma, this lady becomes mayor, she says, you know what, I'd like to appoint you Chair of Entrepreneurial Initiatives for the City of Tulsa, 1996. 19, pardon me, 2006, I'm confused, 2006. I said, you know, that sounds like fun. I could do that. Sure, I got some experience. Ended up starting building an entrepreneurial community and ecosystem before we really started understanding what that is. If you look back in time, 2006, everywhere but Silicon Valley, 2006 is when it started in Dallas, Chicago, Tulsa, other parts of the world as well. And these ecosystems are starting to look somewhat similar, right? So start building this ecosystem, all of a sudden start getting national attention for, hey, Tulsa's got this crazy ecosystem. I started learning more about different entrepreneurs as well. The entrepreneurs that are more lifestyle entrepreneurs. So growing up here, almost taking a company public, the goal is conquer the universe, grow it big, grow it fast, get out, right? Kind of the mindset. It's a whole bunch of other entrepreneurs that don't have that mindset. It turns out it's 98% of all startups are more like the startups you see in Tulsa than the startups you see here in Silicon Valley, which started tweaking my brain a little bit, right? Because I'm like, this is not some strange thing. This is like what's really going on out there in the world. So part of this is gone. That's the font we lost, I think, earlier. Started another company called Busy, started working with entrepreneurs to help them advance their businesses forward, started using visual tools. At the same time, launched this startup cup, open sourced it. So we'd been doing it, launched the first business model competition back in 2007, had great success, started seeing a lot of business, started seeing a track record of being able to move and create successful entrepreneurs. Started, started, launched Startup Cup, open sourced it, and all of a sudden, so this, is, this is 2011, so we're getting close here, folks, to where we are now. All of a sudden, this thing goes global. In one year, we've gone to over 40 Startup Cups around the world. One year. Operating around the world. We just had Macedonia sign up yesterday. It's not on my list up here. Moscow just signed up. We're running these business model competitions all around the world. One of the first outside of Tulsa was here in Silicon Valley. Thank you to West Valley College of Support. All of a sudden, I'm not seeking anymore. I'm on a path. Everything I do now revolves around Startup Cup and growing entrepreneurial ecosystems, nation building. We're partners with the State Department. We're now working with USAID on projects. I leave for Egypt on April 9th, 19th, pardon me. 
to go do some capacity building, to work with entrepreneurs and help grow different and support different people, different entrepreneurs, which are almost all the same, to create and build businesses. So here we go from this crazy kid to here today. And now we're growing entrepreneurs around the world at the fastest rate. Nobody's ever seen anything grow this fast within the actual US government. President Obama got briefed on what's going on because it's like, what is going on? We don't know what's going on, so we're learning very rapidly. But something's happening. So now I'm working on a new book, Alice and I just started penning it, called On the Path, because there's a difference. So all these tributaries that I've been on have now come to form a river. And I don't know if it's because I had to get gray hair and get older, but now I'm in one single focus. Just hired two people. It's pretty exciting stuff. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to get a piece of paper out, wherever that is, and write down your first thoughts right now. I don't want you to judge whatever your first thoughts are. Whatever they are, write down your first thoughts as quickly as possible. Write them down. First thoughts. So feel free to use the papers I handed out. Just use the backs of the papers. And I'd like to get chairs for the three people who, who just came in. Are there any empty chairs? Okay. Maybe some chairs. Write it down. Don't overthink it. This is important not to overthink it. First thoughts. Boom, as they come to you. That guy's weird. I could never do that. What box? What do you got? What's coming to your mind? OK, now, stop. If you're right-handed, put your pencil or pen in your left hand. If you're left-handed, put your pencil or pen in your right hand and write down your first thoughts. It doesn't have to be legible. Write them down. Don't overthink it. Write down your first thoughts. If you're right-handed, use your left hand. If you're left-handed, use your right hand. I think I got that right. Quick. Don't overthink this. OK. Anybody notice that what you wrote with your least predominant hand is different than what you wrote with your right hand? Anybody have that experience? Yes. What, did you, what happened? Can you share? It just went totally crazy. Yeah, see, perfect. That's exact. So Mike Munn, head physicist of Lockheed over here in Mountain View, taught me this technique. Dr. Munn, stud on the planet. His brain is incredible. He's still around. He taught me this as a way to tap my subconscious mind and force myself to think different. So if you, I just, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you a tool to solve problems. If you're stuck and you're thinking the same way, what box, remember we're trying to get to what box, and you want to think a different thought, use your least predominant hand to write with. And your brain automatically kicks into a whole other space and you start thinking different and you start solving problems differently. There's something very powerful about writing. Putting it down on paper or if you have an iPad, if there's paper, anybody know paper on iPads? It's still writing. You've got to write it though. Okay? So what I want you to understand is this. You're born with unlimited potential. It's against all odds. I stand here in front of you today. There is no question in my mind. My life journey has just, you know, it's just against all odds. But it's what I'm supposed to be doing. Because remember, I went back and said, what is my purpose? We all have some reason, something we're supposed to contribute. It doesn't have to be some great, amazing thing. It's just everybody's got a skill. Everybody's got something. But you're born with this unlimited potential, and your brain is an amazing thing. And we're only using about 10% of its capacity. I may only be using about 8% of it, just like my computer. I just don't use a lot of my potential with my computer, my brain. I try like crazy to increase my ability to, to, to use more of my brain, but we're using a very small percentage of our potential. And we're only, we're, so there's still a lot more there. We'll go back to NASA. Love NASA, love Ames, love going there. Love all the people there. Just, it's one of my favorite places. Call it the giant prickly pear because it's really hard to get into NASA and it hurts because you've got to go through all these hoops and things. But once you're inside, it's really sweet and wonderful. NASA. So here's the deal. They do this test. 
for engineers. They want the most creative engineers they can possibly identify. You gotta love them for that, right? You want the most creative uh, uh, engineers. So they, this, this, this guy as a researcher decides, you know what? I'm gonna give this test to 1,500, five, well, five-year-olds, right? 1,500 of them. Here's the result. 98% create, creative. In fact, highly creative for the most part. 98% of those five-year-olds creative off the charts, right? They hadn't even seen it before because why? They're, they're testing engineers. So they, they go back five years later. Same 1,500. Same exact kids. Uh-oh. What's happening? We're teaching the creativity out of them. 30% highly creative. 30%. Five years later, they're now 15 years old. Check it out. 12% highly creative. Same kids, five years old, highly creative, 98% of them. What happens when they become adults? 2%. 2% of those same 1,500 kids who are now adults are highly creative. We've got to start thinking differently. We've got to be able to play. We've got to be able to start tapping back into that childlike behavior that causes us to be, you know, goofballs, right? It's okay to be a goofball. I do it really well. My wife gets upset sometimes. That's a different story. So as children, we're extremely creative. Extremely creative. We know it. You know kids that you're around, you know, they, they're just creative naturally. They don't think about it. They don't know stuff, right? Because we're totally open. We're children. Completely open. We're a blank canvas, right? I have this picture here, and because I, I don't have one, I wish I did, of me drawing on a wall. So when I was a kid, I love pomegranates. Anybody else here love pomegranates? and shoot them across the room. They also make wonderful red markings on walls. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I've been drawing that for a long time. But guess what? No! That's what happened. All of a sudden, we start getting told what's right and what's wrong, right? Starts causing us to have to think differently. Start getting structured. And we start linear thinking, right? We're taught how to be linear thinkers. It's not how we naturally process information. It's not. Technology and the web and iPads and these things are helping us to think more like we naturally think, and that's why some people are accelerated learners. But then we're getting tested. This is where I did not excel, right? Put me in front of a test and oh my gosh, my brain just goes crazy. I can't do that. What? Uh, lost. Still to this day, I don't fill out a single form. I don't do any of that. How come? I play to my strength. I have somebody else, here, help me do this, please, because that's not what I do. I can help answer questions, but this is not my skill, not my strength. So what we start learning is A plus is really good, right? D, bad. Bad. D, bad. And then, what's the goal? We're going to go to college. Okay? We got to go to college. Right? This is what we got to do. And then we got to go get a career. Right? You gotta go get a career because you gotta go get a job. You gotta get married. It's just what you gotta do because you're supposed to. I wasn't gonna get married. I don't know how I got married. It wasn't in the plan. Maybe because I was probably supposed to get married, didn't realize it. Then we gotta pay attention to our credit scores, right? <laughs> right? High credit scores, very important, because why you gotta buy stuff. You gotta keep up with the Joneses. You gotta gotta get stuff. I've been in Dubai. Anybody here been to Dubai? Okay. How long ago were you in Dubai? Okay, so you know what, you're gonna know what I'm talking about. You pull up in front of the Versace Hotel. <laughs> there is a Versace Hotel at the base of the Khalif, um, Burj Khalif, tallest building in the world, craziest thing ever. And there's a dozen Rolls Royces, two dozen Bentleys, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Maseratis, everywhere. People dressed like you've never seen before. Keep, they're keeping up with the Joneses. They've outdone it. They've, just, they've, they've blown by all of us. There's no way to keep up with them. It, we, I don't know how it's going to happen because they're setting a new standard. But then what's the goal? You've got to retire, right? Because your goal is we've got to retire, right? I call it rusting. Don't retire, okay? <laughs> so I say stop. 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 Stop the brain drain because that's what's happening. We're draining our brains. You're in Silicon Valley, people. 
It's the most special place on the planet. It truly is. I'm traveling around the world. There's some great places. Great places. Dubai is fascinating. I want to do a case study on it. I'm working with entrepreneurs there. Guess what? They, won't, they don't want me to teach them how to start a business. They don't want them to start a business. This is true. Emiratis, don't teach them how to start a business. What do you want me to teach them? How to think like an entrepreneur. <laughs> but you don't want them to start a business. No, do not encourage them to start a business. How do you do that? You're in Silicon Valley, people. Stop the brain drain. It's happening here, too. It's happening in Silicon Valley. You're in the most special place in the world. Anything is possible, right? So it's time to break out of the box. I say it's not break out of the box. It's what box? OK, so what I want to do now with you is this. Let's do a brainstorm together. So what holds you back from being more creative? What holds you back from being more creative? You don't have to raise your hand here. There's no rules, right? Go ahead. Don't raise your hand. Just spread it out. Boundaries. Boundaries. What kind of boundaries? Um, hmm. Self-imposed? Yeah. Spelling errors happen, remember. Handmade. Yeah, all right, we're creating these boxes of structures, yeah. Time. Time? Not enough time, what? Uh, just um, schoolwork takes a lot of the time. Uh-huh, all right. Time. Not enough. Money. Money, right. Got to have that, right? <laughs> Money. Bureaucrats. How do you spell that? B. E. 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 A. U. E. A. U. Okay. C. R. A. T. S. C. I butchered that, so there you go. What? Physics. Physics? Understanding physics, not being creative. Oh, I see what you're saying. How, how do you get to think that way, though? What is it? Fear of failure. Uh-huh. Judgment. Judgment. Who's judgment? Social. Well, he didn't like what we were saying, maybe. <laughs> What does? Explaining what you're doing and why when you're creating something. Right. You run out of energy by the time you get done explaining what you're doing. So I have this thing. Whenever I present an idea, who, who, who said that? Chris. What's your name? Chris. Chris, how you doing? Whenever I present an idea and someone doesn't get it, I know I'm onto, a, I'm onto a good idea because they're not my target audience. You don't get it. I tell them, thank you. You just validated my idea. Next, I'm moving on. Uh, right? It's really draining. Yeah, so, so you got to stay away from those people. Okay. okay? Get rid of them. Move those people out of your life. Be around people who are going to support you. I call them eagles. People who are going to support you and nurture you. Very important. We're going to do a little exercise. How, what, what, how much time do I have? Good, I got time, so I thought I did. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to put one other thing on sure. institutionalization. Oh, gosh, hate that, don't you? Yeah. I know. Institutionalization. Just sounds terrible. Huh? <laughs> I'm starting to appreciate it, right? So I'm starting to appreciate some of these things. So institutionalization was one I was totally against. But I've had a couple countries, Egypt, they're institutionalizing the Startup Cup. That's one of their goals. I said, you can't institutionalize the Startup Cup. Then they explained to me how they were going to do it, and I was going to last a long time. I said, OK, you can institutionalize it. <laughs> Let's do a research project. What else? What else holds us back? I would say knowledge. Knowledge? Lack of knowledge? Yeah. Uh-huh. Lack of a grading system? Yeah. A lack of a grading system was holding us back? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, 
clout doesn't work for you? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> uh -huh. right, uh -huh. Okay. How about technology? How's that holding you back? Well, it's I'll put this back up. Uh, an idea that uh, quite possible by uh, what was available to support it at the time. Oh, don't you know? That's true, right? Okay, so yeah. Technology can hold us back from our great ideas. Just because you can uh, conceive it doesn't mean it's quite possible. Right? Absolutely true. Okay. How are you going to overcome what's holding you back? So I'm just going to say one thing. I do this presentation. I wasn't going to do this presentation. Alice encouraged it. She was in Rio de Janeiro with me, and she said that this would be a good presentation to do together. Same, same results. Institutionalization is kind of a new one in physics. It's the first one I ever time physics. But everybody seems to know what holds them back, which I find exceedingly fascinating. You know what's holding you back, right? But yet you let it hold you back? confused. How are you going to overcome? How do you overcome what's holding you back? It's getting harder now. Yes. You Don't have to raise your hand. Okay, you have to find out subconsciously what's in your head mm -hmm. and deal with that aspect. Tap subconscious. Might be your own enemy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Start realizing that failure is good. All right. Okay, I'll try it. <laughs> failure is good. If you're not failing, who said that? You're not, you're not winning. You're not, you're not succeeding. Failure is how you learn. I don't know where we got this all mixed up, but failure is like, oh, don't do that. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, better do that a little different next time. Working fail fast, fail off, and move on. What else? How do we overcome? Stop caring. Stop caring? Ah. I, uh, I um, had people not liking me at one point in my life, and I'm like, I don't want to be, I don't, people don't like me, you know, I'm feeling pretty, they don't like me. Some people really don't like me, and I'm like, why does that person not like me so much? And then I had this very wise man tell me, if people, if everyone's liking you, you're not making a difference in the world. When people don't like you, it means you're doing something because you're taking a stand. You're making a point. You're standing strong in who you are. Not everybody is going to like you. So there is total truth in stop caring what other people think and care what you think. What else? Utilize your barriers as opportunities. Uh -huh. Hang out with my five-year-olds. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Good idea. So here's what's interesting, right? We know what's holding us back. We also know how to overcome what's holding us back, right? It's just easier not to, let's be honest. It's easier for me not to have to get on a plane and go to Egypt, to then go to Pakistan, to go to Palestine, to go to Armenia, to go to Georgia, to go to St. Petersburg for eight weeks straight. It's just easier not to do that. It's just easier not to do that because that's, that's a lot of airports. That's a lot of 
airplane time. That's a lot of just, why would I do that, right? It's just easier not to. That is my travel schedule starting April 19th, by the way. So it's just easier not to go get in your subconscious mind. Why? Because, oh man, you might find some stuff in there that is like, whoa, I'm not doing anything like I want to really be doing. All right, we're going to do an exercise now. Let's pass these around. Oh, sure, that'd be great. Okay, what I'm handing you right now is... Everybody should take one. Everybody, yep, everybody gets one, just one. It's called, where do I want to go? Where do I want to go? What do you want to create with your life, right? What do you want to create with your life? There you go. How are you doing today? No, the other one's a different one. That one's different. Um, I'll give you those. This should be coming around. Make sure everybody gets one. Okay. No, there should there should be plenty. Okay, I wanted to take one. Here, here. Where where do I want to go? These are more. Okay. That's there we go. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody familiar with mind mapping? Okay, uh, you, all, you all know how to draw because you were doing it five years old. So I want to encourage you to, to use as many visuals as possible with words. You can if you get blocked. What I would propose is whatever's the easiest. It's not, about, it's not about using your non-dominant hand at this point. It's about not being judgmental and thinking through if you could create anything in your life what would that be? I've gone back, because I've been doing this now for myself for about 16 years, large scale. You go back and look at that, what I'm doing right now is exactly what I've been trying to get myself to. I just didn't know how I was gonna get to where I am right now. Part of it is writing it down, thinking about and constantly working on where do I want to go? And it does change, right? As you get older, I've found, and as I get more experience, my focus becomes clearer, but you all have dreams. I'd like for you right now to take 10 minutes, don't overthink this, and write down and draw, where do you wanna go with your life? What do you wanna create? Ideal, don't, don't, don't judge whatever you write down. Don't judge it. Don't judge it. Okay, let's do it. It's only if you want them to be, okay? But what I wanna encourage you to do is to start asking yourself more often because you'll be surprised at how many people do not ask themselves, what do I want to create with my life, All right? It's kind of an important question because if you don't know what you're gonna create in your life, how are you gonna get there? Or where are you gonna go? Pardon me? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna work on that next. So it does take time, but what I'm gonna to say to you, what I like to do is get into a quiet space. So what I might recommend is you get into a quiet space, write down where do I wanna go? What do I wanna create in my life? And think about that by yourself in a quiet space and then start drawing that out. But, but get into that space where you actually are looking and tapping that subconscious part of your mind, allowing yourself to dream. There's some directions on the bottom there of how to do that. Those directions are very powerful. Your imagination is a very, very powerful tool and it can imagine things and you can, you can make things real. What's one of the great things about Silicon Valley? Reality distortion lives here, right? Reality distortion means imagining and driving towards and creating something that doesn't exist that everybody else says can't exist. Reality distortion. You can, you can do it, you can create whatever you want, right? Okay, now we're gonna pass out. It gets harder, it gets harder everybody. Now we're gonna figure out how do you create what you want, right? This is where it gets harder because now, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this? There you go, Alice, pass this around. So, 
And this is the part that entrepreneurs, wherever we go around the world, have the block, right? Now I gotta do it? Oh, I've come up with this idea, I've designed it, it looks good. Yeah, it looks like it has potential. But now I actually gotta do it. I gotta go talk to people. I gotta go sell the product or service. Yeah, you gotta build it too. But this is focused on your life. Where do you wanna go? How do I create what I want? How do you create what you want? And so I put up some notes here, okay? And these are universals. These are universals, and you might want to write these down in the back. The how, the hard part, right? You got to let go of the crazy makers. Those are the people in your life who are negative, unsupportive, suck your energy, right? Remove the crazy makers, always. Got to remove your crazy makers. List them if you have to. <laughs> Okay, and then figure out how, it could be your, I had, a part of why I moved to Oklahoma is because of my parents, right? They're crazy makers. <laughs> I got to visit with them on Friday. I got to put like an invisible shell around myself to protect myself from my parents still. I love them. They're my parents. But just the same, they're still behaving like high schoolers. <laughs> I'm not. Let go of the crazy makers, no matter who they are, right? So you gotta figure that out. The other thing is just do it, right? Do it. Or what I like to say is do it scared. I do stuff scared all the time. I'm going into Pakistan for two weeks, Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad to work with entrepreneurs in a place where they pay me $500 extra because it's a dangerous place on the planet. That's scary, right? Do it scared, do it afraid. Sometimes you gotta change your environment. I like to change my environment all the time. So I'm always moving offices. I actually have a building in Tulsa and I'm moving an office right now from where I am. I'm gonna move to another office because it opened up, I'm gonna move there just to change my environment, mix things up, cause a different kind of thinking to take place. The other thing that you need to be thinking about is how you're gonna get there. You gotta collect people. Nothing of greatness happens without a team. Collecting people should be one of your goals for life. Wherever you go, understand what you need, what kind of skill sets you're looking for, and then when you find somebody who has those skill sets, collect them. Have them start being on your team. Collecting people is important. You also have to focus, right? You can't do everything. I was talking with Alice, 75 projects. I was absolutely freaking crazy. I was doing a lot of things not very well at all. I thought I was busy, but I wasn't smart. I wasn't focused. You gotta focus. The other thing is to focus on your strengths. So we all have strengths. I think we spend way too much time working on the things that we're weak at or will never be strong at than we do improving the things that we're really good at and are strong at. I completely have blocked out and do not do anything that is a weakness of mine. I just don't do it. It's a waste of my time, right? I don't have a lot of time, but I work like crazy to focus in on my strengths. My strengths are visionary kind of thinking, designing programs, building relationships, inventing new things. The U.S. well, the USAID, so it stands for U.S. I don't know, USAID. Just was in DC last week. They said, you know what we want to do with you? I said, no, I don't. <coughs> You're the government. I don't know. It's not, I mean, boring, no pictures on the walls, right? I gotta put murals up to help myself feel at home when I show up. We want to become a co-creator with you. A what? A co-creator. We don't know how to create things. We don't know how to design things. You do and we want you to help us create things and then implement them. That's my strength. They identified it, they saw it. The government, that's weird, right? But that means when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and in your strength, even people who are government bureaucrats, serial bureaucrats, this is being recorded, isn't it? We'll never show this to anybody. 
<laughs> I love you. Uh, saw the strength and power of what we do. And what I said to them is this. I said, that's great. Yay. You know why? I don't do what you do. I can't think like you think, and that's OK. But let's be stronger together. And we all left super excited. Just got an email on the way over here from them saying, we can't wait to get this started. And I can't wait either, because guess what? They're going to let me do what I do. You need to figure out what your strength is. Spend more time focused on your strength. Comes to financials, accounting, that sort of thing. Makes me puke. Can't do it. My brain can't handle it. So guess what? I don't do it. Don't do things that make you puke. You want to get yourself into the unknown, right? Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because life is not designed to be comfortable. Somehow we've come up with this notion, we're all supposed to be super comfortable, life is supposed to be wonderful, go buy stuff, eat things, do whatever, it's joy. Life isn't like that really, right? If you're really making a difference, if you're really out stretching yourself and reaching your full potential, it's not going to be easy. That's OK. Get yourself into the unknown. Being in the unknown. The more you get comfortable with the unknown, the more comfortable the unknown becomes. That sounds strange, I know. But it's true. It just becomes really like, OK, I can do this. Or, you know, I'm not going to die. OK, so those are some of the hows. Those are universals, by the way. They, they're, they're just, they are universals. And so they're more. We won't go into more. That'll be another. We go into counseling, maybe, or something. I don't know. Um, but there's more there. You just need to be thinking about now, and I'd like you to spend 10 minutes, and we'll do some Q&A at the end here. Think about how are you going to create what you want in your life? Because you wrote down some things, but now how are you going to do that knowing that some of these things are relevant to you in terms of your how? So let's go. Go ahead. Stop fearing uh Questions? Sure. Asking. Yeah, you know, we're not we're not brainstorming like that. That's great. Write that down. That's for you though. We're gonna edit that part out. Sir, right about the come right there. <laughs> he doesn't have headphones on. I thought I could talk to him. <laughs> Pardon me. I know it's true. Oh, that's wait. You can ask me questions, right? Keep working. I'll let you answer questions. I'll answer any question you want. How? Oh, you already done it? Awesome, dude. Right on. High five. How? How are you going to make what you want possible? How are you going to make that happen? Nobody's going to do it for you. Dang it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the path powerful enough? All right. See, a, there's, there's two different mindsets. There's a creative mindset, and then there's someone that has a different visionary mm -hmm. and, and a kind of concept on, on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Like there's, there's no way that I would ever consider getting on a plane to go to those places and traveling like that anymore. I mean, I, I don't like to leave here. I enjoy my time. Mm -hmm. I understand. And I find it much more simple to make money in this area and, and go home each day than yeah. to travel. It's all about the goal. What do you want to create? What makes you happy? That's right. Yeah, it has to make you happy, right? Place. Very, very special place. <laughs> Kazoo type. Oh my gosh. People are tweeting.
Do I have, where's my thing? Where's my, oh, here it is. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. I just was given, uh, was told. So what I want to do is finish the presentation and I'll open up for Q&A. So the, the question is, so what does all this mean, right? What does it all mean? What does it all mean? I want you to know something. I'm living proof of this. You can achieve and do anything you want to do. It's not going to be easy. Excuse me, one second. It's not going to be easy. I can promise you that because why? It's not easy being green. It's not easy being different. But it's essential. People want today more than ever. You're in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, people. Oh my God, it's my great gift. It's why I can do what I do, because I have Silicon Valley DNA coursing through my blood. Yep. It's the coolest thing, <laughs> superpower. You're in Silicon Valley, but you've got to be different. Even here, everybody's starting to look the same. I'm blown away by it. California casual? <laughs> well, I can't get rid of that, right? It's my uniform. I mean in terms of behavior and look, but, but, but think about what is your strength. Show up different because guess what? When you show up different, you increase your value. You become a more valuable person. People want that. They're attracted to it. They get excited. They don't even know why, right? They're like, that's Sean Griffin guy. We got to call him in because I'm crazy. Like I can do stuff, right? Because I'm different. I'm green. Back when I was working with Mike Munn at Lockheed, working on some crazy stuff, quality function deployment. I don't recommend doing that, by the way, quality function deployment. He used to talk about real-time paradigm shifting. This was before paradigm shifting became a throwaway word, real-time paradigm shifts. I believe we're actually at that point. Everything's changing in real time. We humans are just not able to adapt to it or think about it that fast because it's changing. The world's changing. And guess what? We're not keeping up. I travel around the world. People are hungry. They're hungry. They're willing to work twice as hard as you are. I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying. I see people willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want because they don't have everything we have. They're hungry. The world's moving faster. We're in real-time change. The only reason we don't have real-time real change is because we wouldn't be able to buy enough products to face the change of the technology to buy the products, right? So we got to look inward. Here's the thing. What I've been talking about is you can't project outward. So all these people, I was with a friend yesterday. I love him to death. He asked me to be his best man at his wedding. He's my buddy. But everything is outside of himself. It's not about him. And he's not looking and figuring out what is it, how is he behaving that's creating the situation. He's not looking inward. That was my conversation with him. What is it that you're doing that's creating the situation? It's not these people because they're just doing what they do. What, could, what do you have to do different, right? And I love this quote. Do you know that Walt Disney was bankrupt twice? Do you know that? People know the story? Just before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out, he, he was done. Disneyland, he went broke building Disneyland. Mm -hmm. When he says this, he knows what he's talking about. You also have to nurture your creativity. So this is a piece of art. This piece of art is actually probably as big as that screen right there. It's one of mine. I do art, I just did five pieces the other night. Just woke, got inspired, five pieces of art, boom. Art causes me to think different. I get in touch with something else. I get zone in and I start focusing on the art. And when I come out of that, I'm much better and clear about something I'm working on, no matter what it is. So whatever your art is, whatever your creativity is, nurture it. Kristen, my wife, hers is cooking. The lady will spend five hours chopping up stuff. Whatever she's chopping. 
it's like this. And then you eat the food, and guess what? Every cut was love, right? Because it tastes so good. I used to be 185 pounds before I married her. You have to leverage your networks, right? Leverage people. You, nothing of greatness is achieved without team. Team, why do the Crips and the Bloods like to hang out together? They're a team. They're family, right? That's the reason. Be collecting people. Have a vision strong enough that you encourage them to be part of your vision. Or if you don't have a vision and someone else does, go be part of their vision. But leverage networks. Because you know more than you know you know. You know more than you know you know. It's one of my favorite quotes. I learned it from Mike Munn. I keep repeating this guy. He freaking changed my life. Super, super genius. He says, Sean, you know more than you know you know. What do you mean? What do you mean I know more than I know I know? If I gave you right now a piece of paper and I said, you have five minutes, you have to give a presentation on Egypt, Cairo, you could do that right now. A what? Do it. So I did it. Guess what? I gave a 20-minute presentation on Cairo. I knew more than I knew I knew about Cairo. Same thing here with you guys. Because the other thing he said, but don't ever get so cocky you realize that the more you know, the less you know. So don't ever think you know it all. The more you know, the less you know. And that is so true. The more I travel around the world, the more I meet people and engage with different cultures, I don't know much. I used to think I knew a lot. We have to reward risk taking, right? We have to exercise our brains. We have to take action, because life is what you make it. And this which should say, now, or it does, now more than ever. We need to figure out how to make a difference in our world. Our world needs help. We are in a collection of wicked messes. That is, a series of interconnected problems that we can't get out of thinking the same way we got into those problems. On every level, systems are breaking, right? They're breaking. We see it in front of us. That's why we don't like watching the news. They're breaking. That's great, because that creates opportunity. And where are we? Silicon Valley. Guess what? It's a great place to solve problems. Great, talented people just go into a local cafe right over here in the village. A little cafe, coffee shop. Boy, you're going to get some brain power there. Make a difference. Live an entrepreneurial lifestyle. Never give up. And this is important. The only boxes that exist are the ones you're creating yourself. You create them. Our greatest thinkers, Elon Musk, he does not live in a world of boxes. There exists no box. Forget about his money. Forget about it. He didn't have it that long ago. And he's been bankrupt multiple times. He never ever gave up. He doesn't see a box. He sees a ladder to the freaking moon, right? A ladder to the moon. I bet you he builds one one day. Oh, that's, see, I got this wrong, so that's not my, I'm gonna take that back. All right, I'm gonna leave it there. My email address is sean at startupcup.com. Sean at startupcup.com. Okay, we have some time for questions. That's my presentation. Ooh, anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, for Startup Cup, I have two questions. Sure. First off, what was your, what's your revenue model? <laughs> Love it. Thanks for asking. Okay, so there's another book. I have like 10 books outlined. The, the, one of the books is called Give It Away to Get It Back. Okay, so... Our revenue model is this. It's a freemium model. Let's just take the internet. It's a freemium model. We give away the startup cups, no cost, to organizers, wherever they are. We give them support, all the tools, website, the work. Here you go. Take it easy. Run with it. 96-page book, how to do it. Step-by-step -step guide. Awesome guide, by the way. Um, just saying. And so then what we do is we make money by getting contracts to go work in certain countries. So for instance, in Egypt, it's a contract to do capacity building. Um, in Sharjah, which is next to Dubai, one of the Emirates, we get paid, we got a year contract to go work and help support their entrepreneurial mindset. Not grow companies, just want to be clear, we're not growing companies, we're just working on the mindset. And then um, we get sponsorship dollars, so we have a sponsorship model. 
We had to search for it. So when we started, we didn't know what we knew. So what we knew is this is what we're supposed to be doing. And I was smart enough as an entrepreneur. I've been through so many companies, 21 companies and nonprofits, that I'm like, this is the biggest thing I've ever experienced and the fastest growing thing. And we're not marketing or promoting. We don't market or promote at all. It's just every day somebody signs up. It's just like, wow, this is kind of cool. So we said, we got to focus on this. And so we said, we'll search, for our, we'll search for the model. So we invested our own resources into, um, into the business. Now we're starting to generate revenue. So, OK, my second question is, it's changed. So a lot of times I run into a lot of people who want to start a business, but yeah. they're afraid because they don't know how they're going to make an income right. for the first year, or right. they don't know where they're going to get a passive income. Right. How did you do that? OK. so. So I encourage you all to come to Thursday evening's Startup Cup Build Up Business Workshop. I'm going to be leading that. We're going to, bring, we're going to have a whole bunch of other visual thinking tools. Um, we call them viz tools. Here's the thing. It takes 18 to 30 months, this is new research, before a company through the Genome Project, Startup Genome Project, 18 to 30 months for a startup to reach scale. That's profitability. So it's easy to start a company. It's hard to build a sustainable company. So that's where it's important to have some level of bootstrapping. Okay. And so that's leveraging the resources you have available to you, not trying to go out and raise money, but that you have available to you. And so what, what we did as a team, we sat down and said, what do we have available? And we started selling stuff. We started saying, OK, let's put some money away. What kind of contracts can we get that are within our focus to then do more of what we do? And that's, and that's, how, that's, how, we, that's how we funded it. That's how we did it. Thank you. The, this presentation was fantastic. I don't want to rush anyone, but I know you have other classes to go to, and there's another class coming in. Okay. Please come on Thursday.